Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining today. We are very to have Luca de la Creta from University of Chicago, and he will tell us about the Planck inbound for 2D QFTs. So Luca, please take it away. All right, thanks a lot, Hugo, for the invitation to speak and the introduction. Um, so I'll be talking about this paper that came out earlier this year with Liam Fitzpatrick, Amy Katz, and Matt Walters. And um, the, the, one of the motivations for this work is to understand out of equilibrium um, uh, physics and, and thermalization in, in strongly interacting quantum many body systems. But even if you're not interested in that, um, you'll see that we can learn a lot about quantum field theories um, themselves, even, you know, uh, uh, and properties of quantum field theories that don't have anything to do with temperature by um, considering, by putting the, the quantum field theory at finite temperature and imposing um, constraints. So in particular, I'm going to impose causality in the thermal state, and you'll see that we get a bunch of uh, interesting results on, on quantum field theories in general. So the kind of general uh, philosophy is to try to find universal results for, for generic quantum many body systems away from simplifying limits, like weak coupling, um, large N, holography, SUSY, interability, and so on. So away from these limits, it's often hard to get exact results. Um, but one strategy that's proved, proven fruitful in the past is to try to prove bounds on what your, the observables you're interested in. So here I listed a few uh, examples of successful bounds uh, in the past. One is the Lee Robinson bound on the velocity of, of signals and entanglement in, uh, in local lattice systems. Uh, and it comes from locality of the lattice system. Um, we also have bounds in effective field theories. So usually effective field theories, you have a bunch of unknown coefficients, but um, it's been found, it's been known for some time that by uh, imposing very general pr principles like causality or unitarity, you can uh, find constraints on these otherwise um, arbitrary coefficients. The C theorem can be thought of as a bound where you bound the IR degrees of freedom in, in terms of the UV degrees of freedom. Um, and it, it has some higher dimensional analogs. The average null energy condition is a bound on a, on an energy operator in relativistic quantum field theories. And finally, we have this um, chaos bound on the Lyapunov exponent. And what I want to stress here is that all of these bounds are, are cool because they're really obtained from general principles. And so we think that they apply very generally, uh, including in, in strongly coupled theories where we don't have uh, a handle, a perturbative handle. So I'd like to uh, kind of use this approach to study bounds on out of equilibrium physics. Uh, so there's a number of conjectured bounds out there in the literature. I listed a few here. The first is this so-called Plankin bound, uh, which is a bound a conjectured. Yeah, question. Yes, for the for the chaotic bound, it's a, it's yes. a typo there. It looks like. Uh, what did I do? Um, I thought it's usually bounded from up. Um, yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, no, you're right. <laughs> There's a typo. Uh -huh. Thanks, yes. Okay. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. The um, times are bounded from below and the uh, energy scales are bounded from above. You're right. So th this goes the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Um, in fact, it's it's in the same direction as, as this bound. They're, they're kind of similar, um, um, the, this thermalization bound and the Planckian bound. Except that thermalization time is something much more easy to observe, you know, in, in, in systems and in numerics and uh, experiments, uh, which is why it's very interesting. But it's also harder to find. Uh, there's no there's no um, sharp bounds like this so far on this uh, equilibration time. Um, but it, uh, it, you know, from examples, uh, uh, holography and, and other systems, uh, um, these the, these observations have led to the conjecture that the equilibration times, the time it takes for a, a quantum many body system to reach local uh, equilibrium, when eventually, uh, and then later hydrodynamics sets in, um, this equi local equilibration time is conjectured to be bounded above by the so-called Plankin time, um, H bar over, over temperature. Um, there's also this famous bound on the shear viscosity to entropy ratio. Um, and and uh, the conjectured here, uh, the shear viscosity is an example of a diffusivity and so this conjecture was, was generalized here um, to hold for more general diffusion constants. So what I'd like to do here is to use the general principles like unitarity, uh, causality, and so on that were successful uh, in the past to study, um, to try to prove, uh, um, hopefully, some of these conjectured bounds. So there have been some attempts along those lines in the past. Um, for example, this paper that I'll talk about more uh, later 
showed that um, causality leads to a bound that involves both the diffusion constant and the equilibration time. Uh, I'll explain this more in detail uh, later. Uh, and in this paper, we showed that the average null energy condition leads to another, a similar bound on the equilibration time in terms of the shear viscosity. So today, the focus, the bound that I'll focus on is this Planckian time. And what I'll show is that uh, one can actually prove it um, for two-dimensional quantum field theories. In fact, what can, one can prove more precisely what the right-hand side is. So what we'll, we'll see is that um, from, and, and the constraint will come from causality, uh, we'll see that all one plus one dimensional quantum field theories will satisfy a Planckian bound of this form, where moreover, the function on the right-hand side is, um, is entirely controlled by equilibrium thermodynamics. And it's going to depend on temperature and the it's a dimensionless function that's going to depend on temperature and the various mass scales of the quantum field theory. So this is pretty cool because the right-hand side is, is uh, in a sense, much simpler than the left. It, it only depends on equilibrium thermodynamics. So we're using um, you know, the equation of state uh, to, to bound out of equilibrium physics. Um, moreover, this function uh, turns out to be parametrically large at high and low temperatures. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to think of quantum field theories as obtained from a UV CFT with a relevant deformation. Okay, so I'm going to take an operator of some um, arbitrary UV uh, 2D CFT uh, with dimension smaller or equal to two. This will trigger a flow to the uh, an RG flow to the to the IR, and the IR will either be gapped or will be a, a non-trivial IR CFT. And at intermediate scales, I'll have some non-trivial um, physics, and a non-trivial quantum field theory with scales. And what we'll see is that at um, at height, so so I'll show you this result. Um, in com complete general generality. So we'll get a, uh, we'll see that the, this function f is given by the equation of state, but in some limits, we can actually um, compute the equation of state. Uh, so in general, computing the equation of state of a quantum field theory is difficult, but, but at high and low temperatures, you can use conformal perturbation theory to uh, compute it perturbatively in the deformation. Um, so here there's a relevant deformation lambda. This will, get, this will uh, lead to a scale that I call big lambda related to this coupling. And at temperatures much larger or much lower than this scale, we can use conformal perturbation theory. So for example, at temperatures much larger than the scale, what we'll see is that the, the, this function on the right-hand side is parametrically large. It's enhanced by this factor of, of temperature over lambda. Okay, this is for T much larger than lambda. Uh, and something similar happens at low temperature uh, where now it's, it's enhanced by a, a, power, a positive power of lambda over T. So now this is for T much smaller than, than lambda. Okay, and these deformations, th these corrections only depend on the, the leading operator. So here the leading relevant, op the, the relevant operator that I use for the deformation, and in this case, the leading irrelevant operator as I approach the IR. So how is this such a, before going into the technicalities, let me just say a few words on how such a bound is, is possible. So we, why is it so strong? And also why is it so simple and that it only depends on the equation of state? So there's two things that, two key ingredients that make this possible. The first crucial one is the fact that uh, sound is, um, is close to being luminal, close to being at the speed of light in, in one plus one dimension. So the speed of sound in general in, uh, in a quantum field theory is given by, by this expression, by the derivative of pressure with respect to energy density. So in general, this is some non-trivial function of the equation of state. If you give me a quantum field theory I, and you know the equation of state, I know the speed of sound. Uh, but in CFTs, the equation of state is trivial. It's fixed by, by scale invariance. And that completely fixes the speed of sound to be one over the space-time dimension minus one, speed of sound squared. So in, in uh, 2D, um, this is just one. Uh, so there's no room for hydramic spreading in two-dimensional CFTs. Okay, and for relatedly, we, we uh, Correlation functions, thermal correlation functions in 2D CFTs in the thermodynamic limit, so at infinite volume, are entirely fixed by, by symmetries. So we know that there's no, uh, you know, there's no room for emergence of, of an effective uh, field theory of hydrodynamics. But for the same reason, if I'm at high or low temperature, close to the CFT, the speed of sound will be close to one. Okay, I can get it by using, you know, with conformal perturbation theory. It's going to approach one in the UV and in the IR, so it's going to be close to one. You know, it's going to be one minus some small number um, at high temperatures. And so because of this, hydramics won't be allowed to emerge too soon because if it does, uh, it will leak out of the light cone. Okay, so um, this will lead, to, this is what leads to a parametrically stronger bound on the equilibration time uh, and leads to the fact that quantum field theories often thermalize 
very slowly in two dimensions. Um, so, so that's why the bound is so strong. And the reason it's so simple, the reason it only depends on thermodynamics is um, thanks to another peculiar feature of, of one plus one dimensional um, physics, uh, which is the fact that hydramics is a little different uh, because hydramic fluctuations are, are large. The, the interactions in the hydramic effective field theory are um, relevant. And they lead to a breakdown of the usual diffusive um, diffusive dissipation. So usually we have in hydro, we have sound modes um, that, that spread with, uh, you know, that propagate ballistically, and then they have some k squared width. That's what happens in higher dimensions. In 1 plus 1D, uh, this, this diffusive spreading is replaced by dissipation in the so-called KPZ universality class, um, and uh, which has this, this different exponents. 2 is replaced by, by 3 half. And the analog of a diffusion constant in KPZ, this curly D, is entirely fixed by thermodynamics, as I'll explain. So this is what controls the width of this hydramic front. And because it's entirely controlled by hydramics, by requiring that you know, it not leak out of the light cone, that's how we'll get a bound. And this bound will only involve thermodynamics. OK, so that's basically the result in a nutshell. Um, I'll explain it in more detail as we, as we go on. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, give you the outline of the talk, and then I'll pause for questions. So we'll start by studying the thermodynamics of 2D quantum field theories. Here, um, by discussing this, we'll, we'll find that imposing causality in the thermal state will lead to a number of non-trivial constraints. First, it's going to provide a new thermodynamic C, C function, which will uh, therefore give an alternative proof to Zamoljikov's C theorem. Um, we'll see that it also can be used to constrain the sign of the TT bar term in at the low energy in the low energy limit of, of quantum field theories. Um, yeah, I'll say so. So. But I'll say more about this in a bit. Uh, then we'll move on to the hydramics of 2D quantum field theories. Here I'll explain why um, we have these large hydramic fluctuations in, in 2D, why things are a little different, and, and why dif diffusion is replaced by KPZ universality. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about uh, deriving the bound. So maybe let me pause here for questions before um, going into the rest of the talk. Okay, maybe more questions will come uh, as we go into the details. So um, the, um, let's start by setting the equilibrium thermodynamics. So this is um, uh, described by an equation of states in general, okay? And usually the equation of state can be parameterized, for example, by uh, a function, the pressure, depending on, on several potentials. So if you have more, if you have a bunch of symmetries, you would also have chemical potentials and, and so on. Here, I'm going to consider the simplest case first, where I don't have additional global symmetries. I'll just have the, the um, kind of uh, uh, usual symmetries of a quantum field theory. So I'll have Lorentz and uh, Lorentz invariance and translation invariance. So that the equation of state will simply describe by a single function pressure as a function of temperature. And now this pressure, this, this, this equation of state, you can read off, for example, the thermal expectation value of the stress tensor. OK, so this is the equilibrium. This is the expectation value of the stress tensor in the thermal state. Uh, by symmetry, it has to take this form, and the two coefficients are how one can define energy density and pressure. And these quantities satisfy the usual thermodynamic relations, um, which relate them also to entropy density. So you can parameterize the equation of state with any of these functions, P of T, E of T, and, you know, with P of E or anything. Uh, one, one that's going to be particularly useful uh, in, in, um, in, for today's talk is, the, is to use the the dimensionless entropy density. So the entropy density is, is um, this quantity here, entropy divided by, by volume. And it has units of, um, of one over volume. Uh, and so in, in, in one plus one D, um, we'll, I'll divide it by temperature to make it dimensionless. Okay, so this is gonna be a dimensionless number. And we're gonna use it to track the equation of state. So let's briefly review how things work for a CFT, and then we'll, we'll go back to a general quantum field theory. For a CFT, there's an extra constraint uh, due to the scale invariance, which is that the stress tensor is traceless in the thermal state. Okay, so this implies that E is equal to P in, uh, in 1 plus 1D. So in particular, um, DE by DP will be equal to 1. Okay, now I can use these thermodynamic identities to write DE as TDS, DPS SDT. Okay, I'm just using these things. 
So this is the, the logarithmic derivative of entropy with respect to temperature. And what this tells me is that in a CFT, um, S is just going to be some number times the temperature. Okay, and that number turns out to just be given by the central charge. Uh, and this goes under the name of the Cardi formula. So uh, um, for the dimensionless entropy, it means that my dim dimensionless entropy is as expected, just a number uh, in a CFT. Okay, and it's temperature independent. For quantum field theory, this dimensionless entropy will still depend on the temperature because there's scales in the game. Okay, so now let's go back to quantum field theories and let's um, see what constraint we can get by imposing causality in the thermal state. So I'm going to impose causality in the form of requiring that the speed of sound be smaller or equal to one. Okay, so this will um, give me the following expression. So speed of sound, as I said before, is dp by dE, like so. Now for a CFT, dP by D, th th this quantity is just one, okay? That's what we had said before. The speed of sound is just one in a CFT. So it's kind of at the brink of being super luminal already. Um, but in general, it's gonna be given by this logarithmic derivative of, of entropy um, divided by temperature, okay? And so here, if I use my dimensionless entropy density again, so I write S equals T times S naught, T will give me uh, uh, one, d log t by d log t is one, and then I'm left with d log s naught by d log t. So canceling the one on both sides, what I find is that s naught, uh, the derivative of s naught with respect to t is positive. Okay, so we have a function that's monotonic uh, as a function of temperature. At extremely high temperatures, we have a CFT. Uh, there it's equal to the central charge. At very low temperatures, it's equal to the, to the um, IR central charge. Um, so therefore it's a C function, okay? It's a monotonic function that interpolates between the central charges. Um, so if I plot it as a function of temperature in the UV, it's gonna be equal to pi over three times C UV. As I decrease temperature, it's monotonic, and then it's gonna settle down. We'd settle down to zero if the theory is gapped or to pi over three CIR. If I get it, if I have a CFT. Okay, so this gives a this is a kind of two line uh, alternative proof to the logic of C theorem, uh, coming from imposing causality um, of sound in uh, in two D quantum field theories. One question. Um, so, yes. Uh, does it match with the logic of C function uh, on along the flow? No, it's a different C function. Yeah, thanks for the question. So the uh, they of course match in the CFT, but along the flow. Uh, the Zalmogic of C function is a vacuum two point function of the stress tensor, of the trace of the stress tensor. Whereas this, um, this is a thermal, you could say it's a thermal one or two point function. Um, and they, in general, yeah, in a CFT, the thermal state can kind of be mapped onto the vacuum, but in a QFT, it, it can't, and they're, they're different in general. I see. Okay. Thanks. So here we see that you know even if we didn't care about thermal physics, this would have given us uh, a proof of the C theorem and the and the C function. So we're we're learning a lot of things just from, um, yeah, we're learning a lot of things from from imposing causality in the thermal states. So uh, I'm mostly interested in applying this to to uh, non-integrable theories. But as a quick consistency check, let let's look at an integrable theory where we can actually solve the whole flow. Because in general, it's hard to find the equation of states. You know, it's hard to actually find this this function here. Um, so, so let's um, let's start with a, an example of an integrable flow. Uh, and so, I'll take the example of the um, uh, tricritical Ising model. So, my UVCFT will be the tricritical Ising model. It has a relevant deformation, which triggers uh, an RG flow to the Ising model in the IR. And this entire flow is integrable. So you can solve it with uh, thermodynamic big ansatz and get the equation of state um, still numerically, but you know, to arbitrary, basically to arbitrary precision. Um, so here I plotted the C function uh, against inverse temperature. Um, so it's the opposite of the plot from before. Uh, at high temperatures, we start here at pi over three times um, the UV central charge, which is, uh, which is 7 tenths. Uh, you see that it's monotonic and it settles down to pi over three times one half, the, 
the central charge of, of the IZ model. Um, here, here I plotted the speed of sound. You can see that it's always uh, below one as expected. And where it's farthest from the speed of light is where the slope of the C function is, is largest. Okay, so this is a, a consistency check that everything is working in this, in this slope. But so really we'd like to apply this to um, non-integrable flows because I want to talk about thermalization. Uh, th this, uh, this quantum field theory won't thermalize because it has a, you know, it's, it's integrable. So if I don't have um, uh, an integrable theory, what I can do is uh, use conformal perturbation theory to study it at higher or, or low temperatures. So here, let's, let's, let's do this at high temperatures. So let's say I have some CFT in the UV uh, and I deform it by a relevant operator. So I have an operator of dimension small equal to two. And then I'm going to study at temperatures much larger than this deformation. So this, this coupling sets a scale. And at temperatures much larger than this, I can use conformal perturbation theory. So let's, for example, compute the pressure um, perturbatively in this coupling. Um, so the pressure is given by the, by the partition function. And to leading order is just going to be the Cardi answer of the UVCFT. That's the answer at infinite temperature. But then there's going to be corrections that are perturbative in this lambda. So, um, and, and I can, so, so I'm just going to bring down powers of this lambda in the, in the uh, partition function. To leading order, I'll get expectation value of this operator. Here there's a, an integral. This, this uh, factor of volume will, will cancel the factor of volume here. And I'll just get the thermal expectation value of this operator. OK, and I could go on. The next term looks like this. Now it's going to be a two-point function integrated over the thermal cylinder, and so on. So this uh, this one-point function, so the, the leading term um, would, would come from this one-point function. But in 1 plus 1 DCFTs, uh, operators don't really get thermal expectation values. This thing is going to be 0. Uh, and the reason is that ma the mapping to the thermal state is a conformal transformation. So um, anything that um, only operators in the in the identity uh, various or multiplets can can uh, get thermal expectation values because anything else will just have the same expectation value as it has on the uh, on the plane, which is zero. So um, operators like the stress tensor can get thermal expectation values and they do, uh, which can be fixed by symmetries, but other operators don't. And since there's no relevant scalar in the identity multiplet, um, this operator never has a thermal expectation value. This isn't the case. So this is specific to, to d equals two. In higher dimensions, there would be this leading term to the equation of states. And so um, things would look uh, different in, in higher dimensions. So the leading correction to the equation of states is going to come from this lambda squared term. What's interesting is that it's sign definite. Okay, It's proportional to lambda squared. And we can compute it because we just know the thermal two-point function. This is given by the usual cinch uh, expression, which roughly looks uh, something like this. Um, okay, you, you know what it looks like. This um, it's not exactly this, but uh, and, and you can just integrate this over the thermal cylinder and get the answer. And what you'll find is um, so there's this leading piece, five six, and the correction is um, proportional to uh, lambda squared. There's some number. And then by dimensional analysis, uh, there's powers of temperature that come from this integral. Uh, and, and just by dimensional analysis, it has to match the powers here. So it's going to be uh, 2 times 2 minus delta. OK, and finally, I can compute the entropy density, the thing we, the thing we like. So dp by dt is entropy density. Um, and so the dimensionless entropy density is just this divided by, by temperature. And so this is what you'll find. You'll find that at high in the high temperature limit, it's given by uh, the Cardi formula as expected by the UV central charge. And then there's this correction again, that's um, uh, quadratic in the coupling uh, with some powers of temperature. Uh, and uh, crucially, the coefficient uh, of this correction in, depends on the, on the dimension. This comes from really just integrating the cinch over the thermal cylinder. And it's positive, um, it's positive for all, all uh, delta smaller or equal to, to two as it should be because of the C theorem, right? Uh, our C theorem. So we're, we're decreasing temperature. We should be losing degrees of freedom. And this is indeed what's happening. There's a negative definite contribution correction 
to uh, the C function. So if I go back to this plot here, uh, my first correct my first correction uh, as I lower temperature to the UV answer is uh, negative. Okay. Uh, I have a comment. Yes. And that is, you, you just claimed uh, that operators, one point functions in the thermal state are zero. That's not true. Um, so in uh, even so, in this limit of large temperature or small temperature, you have also some correction to that. Uh, so it's zero up to some large T correction or small T correction. So for example, the epsilon, so the energy density in the easing model in a thermal state is given by the dedicated eta function. So mm -hmm. uh, this statement is definitely generally not true. So uh, mm -hmm. you can see that this is proportional also to the um, three-point coefficient. Exactly. Yeah. So it's going to come from higher order terms. terms. It's going to come from coefficient. So this will this will also have some large t or small t correction, and uh, it's, it's captured by these terms here within conformal perturbation theory. So these th there will be higher order terms which you can interpret as uh, corrections to the thermal expectation value. Here, I'm doing an expansion in lambda. So all correlation functions are strictly in the CFT, where all one-point functions are zero. Yeah, so I should have explained no. this a little bit. Here, all the, the endpoint functions are strictly in the CFT. And I've yeah, already but expanded- But uh, the one-point function in the CFT is not zero for an arbitrary operator in a thermal state. It depends Well, it depends on what operator. So we'll, we'll see an example of an operator, the TT bar operator and T also. Which have thermal expectation values, but I, operators that are not in the identity multiplet can't have thermal expectation values in a two D CFT because you, I mean you can prove this. You just uh, do no, the thermal. No, that's that's wrong. One point function in the CFT in the CFT, not away from the CFT. One point function. These are torus one point functions. No, no, no. So sorry. Basically, this it's is a infinite volume. Function. This is infinite volume. V is sent to infinity first. These are not torus one point functions. This is on the thermal cylinder. Uh, so you, you ex, uh, uh, assume you have an infinitely large system. Exactly. Yeah. This is taking, this limit is taken before anything else. Oh, but then the integral has some, um, IR divergences. Have you taken these properly yes. into account? So it depends. It depends on the dimension of the operator. Um, there's an IR divergence when Delta is one and formally when Delta is zero, there's also an IR divergence. Um, of course, there's no, there's, you know, there's no such case, but actually there is kind of a case if you, if you take a, um, a free non-compact scalar and you deform it by 5,4, this formally had, you know, the integral is the same and it looks like the operator has dimension zero. So there are cases where you have higher divergences and these lead to a breakdown of conformal perturbation. These can lead to a breakdown of conformal perturbation theory. They do in this case. Um, and that, and there's something different happens. Uh, the, the expansion is non-analytic in the coupling. Um, for delta equals one, it, everything is fine. It's just that there's a there's a log, there's a log piece here, that's IR divergent. But actually, it it uh, it gets killed by taking the drift here with respect to temperature. So the entropy density kind of doesn't see um, this this delta equals one divergence. So, so okay, really sorry, the, I, I yeah. didn't get that you said uh, you, you. No, no, it's my it's volume. my fault. I, I didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, I should have said this. Yeah, that, that's why that's why I say that that correlation functions are trivial in the two D CFT because I took the infinite volume limit. It's true that on the torus they're non-trivial. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah. So maybe let me say again that there, there is an issue with IR divergences for a very special case. This case where I take a free compact scalar with a five four deformation. Um, there, you can think of the IR divergence coming from the fact that there is no thermal mass because delta. You know, the, the, this correlator has decays like log instead of a power law and because of this the the cinch the, yeah there's an IR divergence here and and so there the the correction in this theory but it's the only counter example i know of uh, is actually not proportional to lambda squared you can still compute it but it's a non um i think it's lambda to the four thirds something like this for for that special theory but for any other 2d cft um you know you don't have an operative dimension zero so um so this conformal perturbation theory result is correct for in, in other cases Um, all right, um, so let me say one more thing since we're talking about conformal perturbation theory. Here I was talking about the high temperature limits, um, and we checked that you know there was indeed a correct uh, correction to the C function. We can also check the low temperature limit. It's very similar, and I'm actually going to do it because there we'll learn something uh, interesting. We'll see that it's not as, uh, as, as straightforward. 
Um, so it's truly really the same calculation. So at low temperatures, we don't just have a single deformation to our CFT. We really have an infinite tower of, of deformations. You know, we're flowing and we can't, we can't control these coefficients, right? So we're, uh, our QFT at low, temper uh, at low energies is going to be described by a CFT plus an infinite tower of irrelevant corrections. Um, so you could look, you could focus on the leading uh, irrelevant um, operator. So it's going to have dimension larger or equal to two and do again conformal perturbation theory. You'll get the same expression, except now delta is larger or equal to two. So this coefficient alpha um, precisely changes sign when delta is two, which is great because it tells us that now when delta is between three and two, uh, the, the, this, this correction is now uh, positive instead of being negative. As it had to be, because now we're you know in the we're we're going um, as we increase temperature from the IR, we're increasing degrees of freedom. There, there's more degrees of freedom, so the correction to the C function has to be positive. Okay, so so everything is good if the leading operator has dimension between three and two. But it turns out that this alpha this coefficient again changes sign for delta equals three, uh, which is bad. Okay, so so this looks like it violates um, the C theorem and, and causality because the correction to the C function is again negative at low temperatures. Uh, so how, what's the resolution? Well, it turns out that the TT bar operator saves the day. So the TT bar operator is a special, is a kind of, um, it's, it's special because it's the, uh, well, every CFT has it. And also it's the lightest scalar in the identity multiplet. Since it's in the identity multiplet, it can have a thermal expectation value at infinite volume uh, in the thermal state. Um, which is proportional to this expression here. Uh, and it's fixed essentially by dimensional analysis. And uh, because it can have a thermal expectation value, this first term actually gets activated, okay? Uh, so it, it, even though it's dimension four, so dimension of TT bar is four, um, it can compete and beat dimensions, uh, operators of dimensions three because it, can, uh, because it arises one order earlier in uh, conformal perturbation theory. Uh, and, and so it actually just, you know, arrives just in time to save this this uh, sign issue uh, from dimensions of it, from operators of dimension larger than three. So as long as there's no operator, so so if you give me a CFT, an IR CFT, which doesn't have an operator between dimension two and three, and there there are many examples of this, uh, then TT bar will be the TT bar correction will give the leading correction to the equation of states at low temperatures from the thermal expectation value piece. Okay. Um, moreover, now this correction is not sign definite uh, because it comes from this linear term in lambda. So unlike what we had before, we have a non-sign definite correction to the to the C function. Uh, and since you know by by causality, by the by the, the C theorem, um, it has to be uh, positive. Okay. Otherwise, it means that we have sound that propagates outside of the light cone. So so here we see that the TT bar correction. For for CF for QFTs that are described by CFTs that don't have uh, an operator between dimension three and two, um, has to have the right sign. And so this this uh, for for those who have followed the TT bar uh, literature, um, this uh, will probably resonate with a well known fact in the TT bar literature that there's a good sign and a bad sign, and that um, the bad you know the good sign is good for causality reasons. But here I want to stress that I I'm the in in the TT bar literature this statement is made within integrability. So the idea is that you start with a CFT and you deform it with TT bar and you have some prescription for how to go to the UV. Here I'm making a much more general statement where I have, I'm have i looking at the low energy limits of some quantum field theory. There's an infinite tower of irrelevant, irrelevant operators. It's uh, non-integrable. And um, and uh, we see that its sign is still, is still constrained. Okay, so this is a, a constraint on the sign without integrability. So in this sense, it's kind of similar. So, so the, the bottom line is that subluminality of sound implies that any um, IRCFT with a Lorentz invariant UV completion, meaning where we can impose causality, has to have the right sign um, for this deformation. So this is kind of similar to, uh, the, um, uh, to, to these IR consistency uh, or swampland uh, type arguments, bottom up swampland type arguments that are pretty popular uh, nowadays. Where you you find constraints on your IR on your kind of effective field theory by demanding that it be you know causal unitary and uh, unitary and so on. Uh, one thing I want to stress though is that in this case here, so I think in all of this literature, as far as I know, uh, in all of the bottom up uh, swamp time type arguments where you bound um, uh, interactions, the the deep IR is described by a free theory, by a Gaussian theory that then has a tower of irrelevant 
corrections like D54 and, and so on. Here, our IR is an arbitrary CFT, uh, as long as it doesn't have uh, an, an irrelevant uh, scalar with dimension smaller than three, we get a constraint uh, on it, a swampland type constraint on it. Uh, and so as far as I know, it's the, the first uh, constraint of, of this form. And what it also says is that 2D CFTs are kind of at the edge of you know, the swampland uh, in, in some sense. They're at the ledge, edge of allowed theories. Um, and so I think it's a kind of interesting, it's maybe more surprising than the fact that free theories are at the edge of, of allowed theories. And, um, and one open question that I don't know the answer to is, what is the case for higher dimensional CFTs? Are they also at the edge of allowed theories or are they kind of more healthy? Um, my guess would be that they're more healthy, but I, I don't have any, any proof for this. And I'd be happy to chat if you're interested in this. Okay, um, so that's all I want to say about thermodynamics. Yes, question. Yeah, there's a question about this. Um partition function that you showed before, like you are saying the corrections are given by the endpoint functions mm -hmm. in the thermal background. But does it mean that the, the when you evaluate the the partition function, do you use the set of approximation or how do you get the how do you get the corrections? Right. These corrections? How do you get corrections and uh, I, I thought yeah. you need to 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 evaluate the partition function by the set of point. Or it so it's mean. it's easier. Uh, what I what I actually do is just uh, uh, do this expansion in lambda. So I so I know that the um, uh, I, I know that the infinite temperature answer is this, and then um, I, I expand. You know, you can think of of uh, z as being trace e to the minus beta h, and then you have this deformation, and you just expand in lambda. So you get you get these correlation functions. So then you're just computing these correlation functions. But is this z e to the minus of the action, or is yes, e to the minus Euclidean action? So you do the past integration. Yes, but in practice, what I'm doing is I'm just expanding in lambda. So I'm bringing down powers of. I'm not using the. I'm never using. You know, I'm never actually using the the CFT action. If that's what you're asking, I'm just perturbing in the deformation to the to the action. Yeah, so my question is that uh, yeah. will the set of points change? Um, I don't think there's really a subtle point approximation here uh, at, at infinite volume. Okay. Or, or maybe it's stabilized by infinite volume. Maybe that's that's. Uh... Okay. Okay. Because you see the the prescript. I mean, if you expand in lambda, what what there's no there's no saddle point approximation here you just bring down powers of, of lambda and you're you you have to compute these correlation functions of the thermal state and these are fixed by symmetry mm -hmm. because what i'm thinking here is that my intuition is that could it be that your thermal state is also perturbed there is also a perturbation expansion in terms of this thermal state uh, of this thermal state in terms of lambda then the power counting will be different um, I, I think these are accounted for in these higher uh, order corrections in, in lambda. So it, the thermal state we know, we're, we're, I'm kind of assuming that we know everything about the thermal state in the CFT. So I'm never expanding in, in temperature, right? Temperature is just fixed. I know, I know every correlating function in the CFT and then I perturb in lambda and I, so everything changes in lambda. And, you know, eventually even uh, regular operators will get thermal expectation values once you're once you're in a in the QFT, but these the 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 way I see this is in higher uh, order in lambda corrections to the to the equation of state. So okay, this, uh, yeah, I think maybe this, at the second yeah. order it doesn't appear, but uh, yeah, maybe we can discuss later. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, are there any other questions on the thermodynamics? We have a question over here. Hey. Oh, hi, sorry. Uh, so uh, you have, uh, so in the uh, in the deep IR, but not quite at the most uh, IR, uh, you have a CFT perturbed by TT bar with this particular sign, right? Uh, with what's called the good sign. Yes. Good. Uh, so this is at low temperature. At low temperature, okay. Uh, you know, you'd expect to probe the low energy states, 
but with, with this sign, the low energy states kind of look funny, right? Uh, how does that work? Uh, why do they look funny? Oh, so so I, I'm not sure. The energy is complex at low energy. So the vacuum, uh, the vacuum, and uh, other low energy states become complex energies. Well, uh, that's probably, right? that's probably the results you get from integrability. I think in general, it, it probably won't be true. Uh, I'm an tower of irrelevant corrections. I don't just have the TT bar. Oh right, I see. Okay, I, I think your point implies that there may be an upper band on the TT bar coupling as well. Yeah. Again, um, I think I think we're saying there may be an upper band on the TT bar coupling as well. To yes. Um. Yes, but I think probably that would be playing with what I would call the cutoff of the EFT. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I won't be able to make a sharp claim. You can actually get a lower bound if we start playing with the cutoff a little bit. You can get a lower bound if so. Let's say the dimension of the operator is between three and four of the leading operator. This gives a wrong sign correction to the equation of states, and so we need to make up for it with the TT bar deformation. So now it has to be no, not just larger than zero, but larger than roughly the coefficient of that other operator. Um, but there we're kind of probing at temperatures of order the cutoff. So it, it's not a sharp, it's not a sharp bound. So I think, yeah, it, if we start doing this, we can indeed get, there's some kind of naturalness uh, argument on, on what the coefficient of TT bar has to be, but it, it's not very sharp. All right, thanks. Okay, um, so let's move on to the hydrodynamics. So um, we, the, the our the belief of the community, or at least me, is that um, uh, any non-integrable um, system at finite temperature is described by hydrodynamics at, at sufficiently late times. And what sufficiently late times means is that uh, um, you have to wait longer for than some time scale that I'll call the local equilibration time. So this has been tested in basically you know, any system that we can actually study. So at weak coupling, you can use kinetic theory to actually observe the emergence of hydrodynamics. Um, at weak coupling, typically this time scale is very large. It's like one over some power of the coupling because you need to wait a long time. It's the mean free time between collisions. So you need to wait a long time for things to collide and, and thermalize. Um, but we also see it in, in, hydro, in, in holography. We see the emergence of hydrodynamics in holography. And there, the collaboration time is of order one over temperature. And that's kind of the expectation in strongly coupled systems where there's no other scale in the game. And so that has led to the conjecture bounds that this equilibration time be larger than one over T. So um, well, at, at times later than this uh, equilibration time, the the what, what hydromics tells you is that the, the system is described by an effective field theory that's pretty simple because most things have kind of equilibrated and the only things that haven't equilibrated are things that can't because they're conserved. Uh, and in particular, in our case, we'll have a conserved stress tensor. So this tells us that the energy density and the momentum density are slow operators. Their time derivatives are proportional to the gradient of some other operator. So at long wavelength, they're, they're slow. And so the late time physics is going to be described by the dynamics of these, these uh, excitations. Um, the, the, the current, Txx, is not a slow operator. Its time derivative is not the gradient of something else. So, but um, but that idea in, in the spirit of effective field theory, the idea is that we can express it as an expansion uh, in terms of slow operators, up to some kind of Wilsonian coefficients uh, in in a gradient expansion. Okay, so we'll have expressions that look like this. So this, of course, is not meant to be a microscopic equation. There's no relation like this between the stress tensors, but it's an effective operator equation in the effective field theory of of hydrodynamics. Um, so uh, we, we like to kind of make Lorentz invariance manifest. So one, one, uh, what one often does is replace these um, densities with um, the fluid, so-called fluid variables. So the, the temperature and, and velocity where uh, this velocity is unit normalized. And in this notation, we write down this equation that I wrote here, uh, which is called a considered relation in this form. So you write down the most general thing allowed by symmetries. The leading term looks like our, um, these two leading terms look like what we had before for the equilibration for the um, uh, thermal expectation of the stress sensor. Uh, but then there's a new term that one can write down at first order in derivative. Uh, and there would be higher order corrections, higher order gradients. So here this will start at gradient squared. 
uh, in it, this this new term is called the bulk viscosity. Um, in higher dimensions, there's also a, a uh, shear viscosity, but in, in one plus one D, there's no room for shear. So there's just, th this is the only coefficient that we have. So then um, to get, so Hydramix gives you a way to get correlation functions of, of operators like the stress tensor in uh, the thermal state. And to do this, what you do is you linearize around the thermal state. So you write U mu as its thermal value plus a small fluctuation. Um, plug back in in this uh, in this conservation law, solve in the presence of, of sources, and, and then uh, this will so you, you solve to linear order in the presence of sources, and this gives you correlation correlation functions. Um, so this is what you'll get. Here I showed, for example, the the energy momentum two point function. So it has um, what it looks like is it has these sound poles. So if I plot it, um, let's. Let's plot it as a function of omega at some fixed k. It's going to have two peaks at plus minus CSK. And the width of these peaks is fixed by, uh, by this diffusion constant. This diffusion came from the bulk viscosity, so it's related to bulk viscosity in this way. OK, the width goes like dk squared. So this is, and, and here in the second line, I just separated it into these two, um, the contributions of both peaks. So this expression is what correlation functions of stress tensors look like in higher dimensional quantum field theories. Um, they, they indeed have this, this form. Uh, in 2D, it turns out to be wrong. It's wrong because hydromic fluctuations are relevant. So I'll, I'll explain this uh, now. So one way to see this is to look at the equation for the equation will have for, for the stress tensor. Um, so let me let, let's look at a uh, a combination. Let's look at a combination of stress tensor that um, is uh, either right moving or left moving. So this turns out to be the appropriate combination. So it's a combination of the energy momentum of the two um, collective excitations: energy, um, energy, energy, sorry, energy density and momentum density. Uh, and here I separated it so that there, these are the kind of left moving and right moving sound modes. And so uh, the equation of motion for this mode, I'll look at pi plus, looks like this. So it's right moving. It has a diffusive spreading. And then there's some, uh, there's some self interaction coming from uh, nonlinearities in the, in the equation. So, so this nonlinear term comes from um, you know, the fact that, for example, there's a nonlinear term in the stress sensor that involves V squared. Um, it also comes from the fact that things like the speed of sound depend on energy density. And so if you expand it, there's going to be a nonlinear term. So, so this kappa here uh, will involve things like the derivative of sound with respect to temperature, energy density, and so on. But what's important is that it, this nonlinearity only depends on the equation of states. So let's try to figure out when this nonlinearity is important, is relevant compared to, uh, to the leading dissipative term. So a first, uh, a first thing we'll do is that we'll, um, we'll simplify this equation by, work, by following the, the sound mode. We're going to follow the pulse. So we're going to work in coordinates where it doesn't move. Okay, That way, I can get rid of this term. And I just have, in, in this, as I'm following my sound mode, um, I, I simply see a kind of mode diffusing. So in these coordinates, I just have a kind of diffusive mode in the, in the linearized theory, if I just look at these two terms. And this is what its correlation function looks like. This is what a diffusive uh, correlation function looks like. It's a Gaussian that spreads in time. And there's an overall power of time. Um, which you can get by remembering that if you integrate this over all of space, so here just over x, uh, it um, it has to give you a constant because because these things are conserved. Okay, these densities are conserved when you integrate them over space. So this in general dimension would be would be one over t to the uh, d minus one over two. Um, that that's where dimension comes in, and that's why that's where where it's going to be different in higher dimensions. But let's focus on on one plus one d. So this implies that. Uh, densities, hydramic densities, scale like uh, omega, like frequency to the d over four, 
or k, so omega scales like k squared in diffusion, k to the d over two. So now we can use this to kind of uh, uh, guess when, the, we can use the scaling argument to figure out when this interaction is more important than, is, is relevant, is more important than diffusion. So if we compare both of these two last terms, we see that the diffusive term has an extra gradient, it has an extra k, whereas the interaction has an extra power of pi, which scales like, um, sorry, these d's should have been ones. This is the spatial dimension. So here, pi scales like omega to the one quarter because uh, it's two point function scales like one over the square root of t. So that's k to the one half. Um, so here, the extra power of pi scales like k to the one half. Okay, so we see that it's, that it's relevant. Um, interactions are relevant. And another way to see this, if you computed loop corrections to, to hydronics, you'd see that they're bigger and bigger as loops, uh, as you have more and more loops. So, so that's an issue. The perturbative expansion in one plus one D of hydronics is, uh, is, is a breaks down. Uh, and it's replaced by a new kind of dissipative fixed point that is not diffusive. So it turns out that we can still say some things about this dissipative fixed point. Um, in particular, we can find, so diffusion is gonna be replaced by uh, dissipation with some different exponent z. And we can actually guess z just from this equation. So let's try to um, scale things so that the, the, the kinetic term uh, uh, scales the same way as the interaction. So the kinetic term has a time derivative, that's uh, k to the z, whereas the interaction has a gradient and it has an extra power of pi, so k to the one half. So for these two to scale the same way, we need z equals three half. And this turns out to be an exact uh, result. You can actually derive it from the symmetries of this, of this equation. So the new dissipative fixed point that replaces diffusion has this, um, has this scaling in one plus one dimensions. And this uh, fixed point is actually called the KPZ uh, universality class. This equation has been studied a lot in different, uh, in different contexts. Um, and a lot is known about it. Uh, the, the analog of a diffusive scaling function. So before I, I gave you the complete expression for the stress tensor two point function, that small uh, in the hydramic limit, a small frequency and wave vector. Uh, here, I won't be able to do this. We don't know analytically what this thing is, but we know the, the k to the three half, this is, is known analytically and some limits, the limits of this function are also known um, analytically, but it, in general, we don't have an analytic expression for it. So the bottom line is that this is what stress tensor correlation functions look like in uh, 2D quantum field theory. And here, this curly D, uh, where it came from is from this, this interaction, what I called kappa over here, okay? And this kappa, as I said, is entirely fixed by the equation of states. So it's a, it's a much simpler object than diffusion um, because if I know equilibrium physics uh, of my quantum field theory, then I, then I know this thing. It's not an out of equilibrium quantity. And this is what will fix this curly D. So curly D will be a function of you know, CS and derivatives of CS with respect to, uh, to temperature and, and so on. So now if I, um, if I plot this, this function, it's still gonna look very similar to what we had before. It still looks like two peaks. I have two my two sound modes. The only difference is that their width is um, a little different, a little sharper, and it involves this uh, curly D. All right. Um, okay. So that's now we have all the ingredients to actually derive the bound on on thermalization. Um, so uh, if there are no questions, I'll. I'll do that. So the, the bound is going to come again from imposing causality in the thermal states, but now on really out of equilibrium physics. Um, there's been some, this, there's a long history in, in, in studying the kind of tension between hydrodynamics and uh, causality. Uh, in particular, I'll, I'll, I'll review this, this paper. Um, so what, what they did is they considered a system that has a sharp light cone and that has the emergence of diffusion that diffuses in the at finite temperature. So this could be a relativistic system, or it could be a lattice model where you have a Lee Robinson velocity uh, and so on. Um, and what, what uh, they found, so one can get a very simple constraint from imposing, uh, from imposing causality, uh, and it goes as follows. So, so we have this sharp light cone. Now a diffusive mode um, will spread in this way, okay, diffusive front, if I have my heat diffusing, that's how, that's how it spreads. And so necessarily, it looks like it goes outside of the light cone at early times. 
which of course is fine because hydramics is supposed to be an effective field theory at late times. But what it tells us is that hydramics can't emerge too soon. Otherwise, it's going to leak out of the light cone. So this will give us uh, a bounds on how early hydrodynamics can emerge on this equilibration time. Uh, and you can get it by just equating these two, these two expressions. And, and this is the bound that you get. Okay, so it's a bound that involves the diffusion constant and the equilibration time. So now we can slightly generalize this, this statement to, uh, to modes that aren't just diffusive, but that uh, spread ballistically, that are sound modes, and that have some general um, width, okay, like k to the z. So uh, it's clear that we're going to get a slightly stronger bound because now already the speed of sound uh, goes in, you know, is not is non-zero. In particular, we're going to be interested in cases where it approaches the light cone. Uh, in addition, it has some width. That's uh, so some delta x that that scales in this way. Okay, this is the analog of the diffusive uh, width. So now we're going to impose causality by saying that this delta x better not take us outside of the light cone. So delta x, uh, this delta x better be smaller than the distance to the light cone, which is um, t times c minus cs. Uh, good. And so this leads, uh, so, so once you, you solve this for, for T for time, and, and this is what will lead to the, to the falling bound here. So, so this is for general Z for KPZ. Um, we had found that Z was equal to three halves. And so in this case, the bound looks like this. Tell X larger equal to D squared over one minus CS cube. Okay, so this is the promise bound where the right hand side only depends on the equation of state. CS only depends on the equation of state. And curly D, it, as I said before, is coming is this KPZ di dissipation. Unlike a diffusion constant, it only depends on the equation of state. So we, we can uh, spell out this equation, uh, spell out this bound. This is what it looks like in, in, in full glory. So the right hand side is this thing that only depends on the equation of state. And I parameterized it with the speed of sound and derivatives of the speed of sound with respect to, to quantities. So let's just uh, kind of dissect this equation. We have this first factor of one over temperature just by dimensional analysis. This is the, the you know, so-called Planckian uh, bound. And then the rest is a dimensionless quantity. Um, first, there's this number here, one over entropy density, which tells us that the bound uh, becomes weak at large n. So in large n systems, uh, this dimensionless entropy density will go like one over n squared or one over some power of n, uh, and, and the bound becomes weak. And the reason it becomes weak is that large n suppresses hydrodynamic fluctuations. And so they actually kill this KPZ, they, they kind of preserve diffusion. You, you still, in, uh, in, for example, in holography, you never see these, these uh, long time, these um, hydrodynamic fluctuations because, uh, because of you take the large n limit first. Uh, but at any finite n, they're there, you just have to wait for a long time. So in, you can actually still get interesting bounds uh, at large n, but you just have to use diffusion instead of KPZ. So here for, for this talk, I'll focus on, on you know, uh, finite n systems and assume that KPZ is the relevant um, hydrodynamics to, to talk about. And then the final thing is this function, um, this dimensionless function that depends on the equation of state. Um, and uh, moreover, we also see that it becomes parametrically large at high and low temperature because this one minus CS, because the speed of sound um, approaches, approaches one. So this function is much larger than one at um, high or, and low temperature. And in fact, we can compute it within conformal perturbation theory. Uh, for example, at high temperature, this is what one gets. Uh, this one over S not just becomes one over CUV. And then this function becomes some positive power of of temperature over lambda and that depends on the dimension of the relevant operator. Okay, so what we see is that we have this, this Planckian bound. The bottom line is that 2D quantum field theories um, satisfy this Planckian bound and in fact typically thermalize slowly because, uh, because of causality and because of a strong constraint you get from causality uh, at low and high temperatures. Okay, um, so that's uh, the main stuff that I wanted to talk about. There's a number of uh, bonuses that I, I could mention if people are interested in, but um, I see that I'm already out of time. So I'll just maybe quickly just mention them. Uh, so all of this was in two dimensions. A lot of things I said are very specific to two dimensions. Uh, there's no reason to expect that higher dimensional quantum field theories thermalize slowly. They're in fact, I think one should expect that they typically thermalize fast. Uh, and, and the reason is that there's no 
tension with causality in the thermal state. The speed of sound is, is uh, comfortably causal in higher dimensions. And uh, moreover, because you know, this leading correction to the equation of states involved a, a, a thermal one point function, and that doesn't vanish in higher dimension, the, 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 the correction is not sign definite. And so the speed of sound can be approached from above or below. So I don't think there's as much to be, uh, as strong statements one can make in higher dimensions, but uh, there might be still interesting consequences to um, um, causality. Uh, uh, it would be nice to see if there's an analog of the C theorem that one can get from, from thermal physics. Um, finite density, so everything I said was for, for QFTs without global symmetries, but it basically generalizes uh, without effort um, to, to global symmetries, at least for U1, even at finite chemical potential. And the reason is that, uh, again, CFTs are, are basically trivial, even if you put them at finite chemical potential, thanks to the enhanced uh, symmetries um, uh, and, and the current algebra. At large C, I mentioned that, um, or large N, I mentioned that the, the bound I wrote down here becomes trivial, uh, but one can still get uh, some interesting bounds on, on causality uh, if one considers diffusion. Uh, and finally, let me just mention that we're one of the motivations to do this is also that we're working on numerics uh, in in um, in 2D quantum field theories, where we're um, observing. So the, the theory we're looking at is actually 5-4 theory. And uh, using Hamiltonian truncation, one can study uh, the this theory numerically, basically uh, doing exact diagonalization, but for quantum field theories. And what we're looking at is uh, studying the out of equilibrium um, thermal physics of this uh, quantum field theory. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Thanks a lot for your attention and your questions. And uh, I'll stop here for more questions. Thank you, Luca, for this very nice talk. I think we still have time for a few questions. Um, yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So when we when you turn on the deformation for the theory that you deform it from the critical point, your theory from critical point, then the conclusion is that um, the system will thermalize like slower than before. Do you have some intuition? So not not than before. Uh, with my definition of thermalization, two D CFTs don't thermalize because uh -huh. they never. Hydramics never emerges. So the pick, yeah, so, so there's not there's nothing discontinuous happening here. It's really the CFT wasn't thermalizing because hydro never emerged. It was just everything was fixed by symmetry. And then if you turn on a very small deformation, it is going to thermalize, but at very, very late times. So you'll have to wait a very long time to kind of leave the CFT and let the relevant operator uh, do its thing. So is it safe to say that it is the, the, uh, this operator, like this uh, relevant deformation that leads to the thermalization behavior. Exactly, exactly, yeah. In, at high temperatures, you can really assign it to that relevant operator. One way to understand what's happening is because CFTs have this, 2D CFTs have this large tower of conserved uh, charges, the KDV charges, which kind of, which are what uh, are, is prohibiting thermalization. And any relevant, any deformation, any relevant deformation um, uh, will break these, symmetries, this infinite tower of symmetries. So it's gonna break it, but at high temperatures, you still have to wait a long time to see it being broken and, and to allow things for to thermalize. But is this long time, is it because that your system is, is like very large? No, it doesn't depend on the, si the system size. So I, I, set, I, set, I send volume to infinity from the start and this equilibration time doesn't depend on system size. It's uh, it's this Planckian time times a positive power of t over lambda. Uh -huh. But is it possible to 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 have a finite size uh, to study a finite system? Finite size system. Finite size system. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there. Okay. Yeah. There. there there's a lot. There, there's more scales that come in the game. Um, yeah. Because then it seems like the the expansion you wrote before, like the, the corrections in terms of number. Mm -hmm. somehow doesn't seem to work. Well, it's more subtle. I mean, I, I don't even know the correlation functions of the CFT on, mm -hmm. on the, 
on the torus. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. It, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so I, 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 maybe there's something interesting to be said, um, but um, yeah, usually when one thinks of thermalization in, in, um, in, yeah, in, in the kind of condensed matter context, one takes volume to infinity first and studies at finite temperature. But um, but yeah, maybe there's room. There, there's certainly room for interesting thermal behavior in in two D CFTs if you put them at finite volume. Mm -hmm. Thanks. More questions? That doesn't seem to be the case. So we can thank Luca again for, for this very nice talk. Thanks.